Oh. It's this here. Many thanks to the India Oxford Initiative for hosting me here at the beautiful Ashmolean today. I'm so excited. Today, I'm going to be talking about my work in Delhi's partition refugee resettlement colonies, where I documented families' multi generational interactions with urban space and housing. This work was primarily undertaken while I was completing my PhD thesis at Binghamton University in New York. Before I jump into the particulars of this project, um, let me provide you with a quick overview of what contemporary archaeology is, which may sound a bit oxymoronic to some of you who aren't familiar. While archaeology has traditionally involved the study of material remnants of the past, contemporary archaeology is the study of material process across modern, changing, and lived-in landscapes. While relatively new, it's a rapidly growing subfield with a dedicated journal and a history of scholarship that now spans back roughly 30 years. Contemporary archaeology emerged from a moment commonly referred to in our field as the post-processual turn. During this time, there was rising awareness surrounding the impossibility of objectivity and self-reflexivity, especially about things like personal goals and research motivations. At first, this type of critical questioning led to a flurry of work focused on the politics of material heritage and site management. Eventually, however, it grew to encompass not only the politics of materials from the past in the present, but also materials of the present themselves. Using archaeological approaches such as systematic on-site survey and the identification of spatial patterns, Contemporary archaeologists seek to address pressing problems in the modern world, particularly problems that have really distinctive material ramifications. So things like homelessness, natural disasters, or warfare. The physical and evocative forms of evidence towards which archaeologists draw attention really lend themselves towards serving as material witness to these types of current hardships and atrocities. And because of the lack of temporal distance between contemporary archaeologists and the subjects that we study, there's hopefully a real potential for us to directly intervene in the present. I consider the problem of forced migration and displacement. And this is really a problem that has become characteristic of the contemporary era. As of 2021, the UN estimates that 89.3 million people, which is just over 1% of the global population, live in a state of displacement. As sociocultural anthropologists Georgiana Ramsey and Lisa Mulkey have articulated, displacement as a concept is used to refer to many different types of situations, sometimes a person's political legal status, sometimes the precarity of someone's situation, or sometimes actual physical relocation. But in its diversity of meanings, by scholars and publics alike, displacement is almost always viewed as synonymous with crisis. Unfortunately, this equation of displacement with crisis, while meant to draw attention to human suffering, also risks affirming nation state sovereignty as the natural order of things. And this affirmation serves to justify the continued control and rejection of people who are quote unquote out of place. As an archeologist approaching this topic, I'm concerned with identifying what produces tangible material crisis in context of displacement. And alternatively, I'm also interested in considering what might reduce such crisis level hardships. My research in Delhi considered this topic in the context of the partition of India and Pakistan, which took place on August 14th of 1947. As the British left the subcontinent in their wake, they left a haphazardly drawn border between newly independent nations. And it resulted in what was likely the largest mass migration event in human history, involving as many as 17 million people. Hindu and Sikh in individuals moved towards India, which was defined as a secular republic to which they were assumed to already have cultural ties and affiliations, while Muslims moved towards Pakistan, defined as an Islamic state and a new religious homeland. As many as 2 million people perished during this contentious population exchange. 
Delhi, the capital city of India, was radically transformed by this mass displacement event. As many as 75% of the city's Muslim population left permanently, moving towards Pakistan, while many more were internally displaced from their homes by violence. In turn, over half a million incoming refugees from what became Pakistan resettled in the city itself, most arriving with nothing and requiring shelter and assistance. The situation was really dire. And as first Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru stated at the time, there's no other example in the history of the world when a newly born state had to face such heavy odds at its very inception, our future seemed dark. If you've ever seen a, a photograph of the partition, um, it's likely of the temporary relief camps that were started in Delhi, like this one that appeared in Life magazine. Um, refugees initially stayed where they could um, in this type of temporary government run relief camp with friends or on the open pavement in the city. Um, eventually, however, most settled into more permanent forms of housing. Um, and these took two primary forms. And these are the types of housing I study for my research. Oops. Um, the first is evacuee properties. These are buildings that were vacated by Muslims who had either left for Pakistan or who had fled to safer locations within the city. And these properties became state property that were utilized as a resource to help incoming refugees. In Delhi, at least 190,000 refugees were ultimately housed in this type of property. Um, and they numbered as many thir as 30,000 different evacuee property units. Um, I'm not gonna be focusing on this type of housing for my talk today, although I do consider it in my book manuscript. Today, I'll be focusing on the other kind, government-built refugee colonies. Um, these colonies, most completed in the early and mid 1950s, provided a very different type of resettlement setting namely small functionalist modern living units. Over 20 such colonies were built in Delhi and these in, in total included over 50,000 living units capable of housing approximately 320,000 refugees. These colonies really represent a massive scale government investment in the permanent resettlement of refugees in the city. Within, um, actually let me, this over here. Within 10 years following the partition, the urban footprint of Delhi really expanded, almost doubling in size. And a lot of that, especially in the northwest and south of the city, was due to the development of refugee colonies such as these. I should note before I continue here that um, partitioned refugee communities do not really fit the expected definition of refugee. Um, this is because as long as they arrived before a specific date, so before the 19th of July, 1948, their right to citizenship was largely assured by the constitution. Um, in fact, many in India considered their migration a homecoming because they were viewed as the ones after all who had really given up the most to realize an independent India. So in this way, they're perhaps slightly more aligned with populations today defined as internally displaced persons by the UN, populations who've been dispossessed and driven from their homes, but who are not remaining stateless. Um, this is an important distinction. And in fact, as early as the mid 1950s, displaced person became the term preferred by partition refugee communities and the term that was used in government documents. Um, it distinguished them from later refugee communities like Tibetan communities who fled to India with the Dalai Lama in 1959, Afghan groups who came to India after the Soviet invasion in 1979, or even more recent groups like Muslim asylum seekers, many of whom have been impacted by the 2019 Citizenship Amendment Act. These communities, in contrast with partition refugees, are perceived as people out of place separated from assumed national cultural homelands and perceived as being perpetually in need of charity and refuge. In this way, there's a hierarchy of displacement associated terms. Refugee meaning permanently handicapped and displaced indicating a more temporary predicament. 
You'll notice that I choose to continue to use the term refugee throughout my talk today because I really question the validity of this distinction, which categorizes some displaced communities as a better investment than our others. Within the negotiation of these semantics are assumptions about refugee communities' potential use value for a host community. Displacement studies scholars from various disciplines have drawn attention to the ways in which understandings of national belonging in the modern world, in addition to being tied up in understandings of culture or ethnicity, are also tied up in assumptions about class and economic aptitude. As the political scientist Luca Mavelli has summarized, citizenship increasingly becomes a function of the neoliberal political economy of belonging, a political rationality that enthrones the market as the fundamental and essential measure of value and worth. The entrepreneurial state will approach prospective citizens as living resources that may be managed and harnessed for economic purposes. This type of rationality my video again here, while increasingly impactful today, was present even within mid-century understandings of belonging following the partition. For example, um, the two competing representations of India's refugee population in the media centered on this question, would refugees be an economic benefit or detriment to the nation? Some accounts portrayed them as martyred citizens and a potentially productive force um, all they needed were things like temporary shelter and food, and likely they would become self-sufficient again. Um, but other accounts portrayed them as a potential threat to the national economic interests, um, an expensive liability, kind of a mass of wards of the state who would remain so perpetually. Um, through my archaeology of Delhi, I sought to better understand how these meanings and associations surrounding partition refugee resettlement were negotiated on the ground through both government allocations of space and refugee communities interactions with space. I sought to develop a method that worked across social scales, identifying citywide patterns, but also sampling more qualitative individual experiences. So to do this before I started field work, I identified 73 areas of interest relating to resettlement. Most were places where there's a high density of either evacuee properties or these types of government built homes. Um, I was in the field for close to a year and spent an average of two days at each site location. Sometimes a lot more, sometimes a lot less depending. Um, I employed a three-step process in considering each area. First, I did archival research and literature review. Um, I considered the area's development through time, referencing especially town planning maps, um, but I also looked for mention of the area's name within archival documents, previous scholarship, and historic newspapers. Um, I then completed site visits within each location, first evaluating streetscapes. So I conducted what we call in archaeology a pedestrian survey taking geolocated photographs of building facades and recording general building trends that I could observe from the street. And with assistance familiar with each area, including um, Sumita, who's in the audience today, I also interviewed people on the street and in local markets asking about general perceptions of areas. How livable is it? What's the history of this area? Finally, as the third step, to consider individual homes, I interviewed families at length about their personal experiences. I should stress here that this was not ethnography. I was not staying for a long time with one community or one family. Um, this was qualitative interviews focusing on really mining specific information about built spaces and material culture. And it's a method that I would suggest is close to what contemporary archaeologist Laura McAtney has termed site responsive oral testimony. Um, interviews took place within people's homes, the homes they were talking about. And as they shared their stories with me, I documented things about the homes as well, how they had altered them through time, taking photographs and drawing floor plans of the buildings. What I found um, through this approach may surprise some of you, 
I'm, I'm going to argue today that government colonies served as a fairly effective venue for resettlement. Um, they largely optimized post-independence ideals of post-colonial egalitarianism, and they sought to directly combat legacies of colonial era housing inequality in the city. Refugees were provided with modest homes and they were not segregated by income level or place of origin. The designers of the colonies also strove to provide each family with private space and personal ownership. Communalism was not a goal here. Um, this was a direct attempt at bettering the housing conditions of the urban working classes, whom during the colonial era had suffered in really crowded conditions in the city. Government designers, um, minimalist designs, in fact, incentivized making additions through time and incentivized self-help. Um, in most cases, less than 60% of the plots were covered with housing, and the government expected a lot of to change and add to their properties through time. Um, these plans weren't actualized. It was part of an event to try to collect ideas about how to build homes, um, but to just kind of capture the zeitgeist of this moment, you see here there's a, there's a um, proposal for a house that could be built in phases, different stages. And here is one that leaves space specifically for future rooms. Um, this type of planning allowed for regulated, reduced forms of inequality. Families could differentiate themselves, but not excessively so. They didn't have room to excessively distinguish themselves. Archaeological approaches like pedestrian survey helped me to consider the extent to which these documented goals were actualized on the ground. Within colonies completed by 1951, like Lodge here, um, the rare examples of original and altered units that I found in the field were actually discrete single family homes on sizable plots. So the main types are 100 square yard plot homes, 200, um, and shop come residences. Both the 100 and shop come residences are built as row buildings, whereas the 200 square yard plot homes are surrounded on three, three sides by open ground. Um, so th this is largely reflects what, what was found in government documents. However, um, these types of units were not perfectly standardized. Often they were built to kind of fill whatever space was available. So for example, this very odd shaped unit was built to encircle a gold chukka or a roundabout, um, much to my frustration because the tool I was using to create floor plans like to snap to right angles. So it took a very annoying amount of time to attempt to map this space. Um, Later built colonies though, um, those that were built in the mid 1950s started to diverge from the plan more and more. So this was at a time where the government had expected the inflow of refugees to stop and it just didn't. So they started building much more rapidly and they started building units that could accommodate more and more people. Um, this includes what's referred to in communities as double stories. Um, and also four unit complexes, which are sometimes referred to in communities as A type housing, um, but they house four people. So I heard mention of double stories within documents about allotments, but they were not mentioned in the type of government pa pamphlets that were bragging about what had been accomplished, right? Um, so it was a little bit more difficult to predict where I was gonna find them, but I did end up realizing that they are of really distinctive shapes. So they're very easy to see on satellite imagery and very easy to pick out within the city. Um, so why am I telling you about all of these housing types? My point here is that there was a degree of hierarchy in the subsidized housing available to refugees. Um, and it was the wealthiest refugees who were able to access the largest homes. Um, the scheme was based on compensation, not full compensation, but a gesture towards compensation. Um, however, within this hierarchy, none of the homes were excessively large or small, um, as had been the bungalows and tenements of Colonial Delhi, right? And the largest units only provided three main multi-purpose rooms, while the smallest only provided two, albeit with much less private space and open plot space. 
What is interesting about this model is the extent to which it combines aspects of both socialist and capitalist planning. Trademarks of Nehru era India were open-minded cosmopolitanism and also Cold War era non-alignment. While Nehru wanted solutions that were specific to India, he drew inspiration from other global contexts and involved experts with seemingly competing perspectives in development projects. This include, included people who were directly involved in New Deal projects in the United States, but also people who had been involved in creating um, steel towns in Soviet Russia. Um, what was socialist about Nehru's vision was that he believed that every citizen should have a house. He thought the state really owed citizens this assurance, but in return, he expected citizens to be self-sacrificing, hardworking, and accepting of pretty simple living. His vision could also be characterized as somewhat capitalist though, I would argue, um, because he believed each family should have privacy, autonomy, and this prospect of really self-directed upward mobility. Okay, completely diverging a bit here because of our particular circumstances today. Let's see. I want to acknowledge that this was a unique vision and perspective and one that I would argue is uniquely Indian. We sit now within the oldest public museum in the world. And that's one of the first spaces in which people constructed really intentional narratives about their relationships with others, right? Um, and as museologist Walkley has recently described, in the Ashmolean, such narrative constructions have commonly involved depicting South Asia as the pawn of outside influences. For example, she writes about how the Indian gallery here is situated between the Chinese and Roman galleries, both of whose impacts on India become the focus. In such readings of history, and in the types of characterizations of the recent past, like the one I'm presenting here today, we must assert that South Asia was and is a major force driving global change and innovation. So compilations of seemingly globalizing material culture in South Asia cannot simply be characterized as subpar approximations of Western development as they so often are. Yes, I really am suggesting here um, that Delhi's refugee colony should be celebrated as India's accomplishment. But before I go on, there are some important caveats that I wanna talk about. Delhi's refugee resettlement project became a highly visible national pride point, at least for a time. Um, not to mention the government stood to gain much economically from refugee enterprise. Um, thus, the state's dedication to resettlement should not be looked at as purely philanthropic, right? Um, another caveat is that while I've just described refugee colonies in a very positive light and talked about kind of the standard types that we see, there were atypical colonies that broke this model that were built to serve really specific niche purposes. And these outliers did not strive to maintain resident autonomy privacy or equality. In fact, in many cases, quite the opposite. So some, for some really evocative examples, Rager Pearl was established for Rager caste refugees who are a scheduled caste in India, while it later became formal policy for the government to disregard caste in resettlement planning. This colony spatially segregated Rager refugees within a portion of the city within which the colonial government had kept for Rager caste communities. Um, so this really perpetuated the importance of caste distinctions in this case. Pasturba Niketan was another atypical colony. Um, it's located within Lajpat Nagar, but this one was established specifically for partitioned widows. And unlike the other colonies that prioritized Alati privacy, this colony was designed around surveillance and even included live-in government staff. So basically the state here sought to fill the traditional role of male family members by controlling the daily, the daily lives of unattached women. And there are accounts of um, the staff doing things like monitoring how much milk each child drank living in this community. It was very, very intense surveillance. As the last day typical example, Faridabad, which is in the national capital region, but is really a huge city in and of itself, was established specifically to help refugees from the Northwest Frontier Province, 
the thinking was that while refugees from Punjab still kind of had access to a part of their province, um, Northwest Frontier Province refugees had been completely cut off from their cultural homeland. So they were assumed to need more help. Unfortunately, um, this, which was an industrial colony, because of this really dictated what life should be like. And there continued to be unemployment and labor unrest here, again, because it was very prescribed to what you should be doing. Aside from these more coercive um, examples, however, um, largely refugees were left to leverage their properties creatively. And most families added on to their houses very quickly and continued to expand through time. As an example, this is the alteration history of a 100 square yard plot house. The original Alati added a kitchen in the back plot. He sold the property to another refugee family. They added additional rooms to the ground floor. As their sons got married, they added additional floors into separate flats. Then after 1990s market liberalization in India, when private development became more common, the family allowed an investor to buy into the property. The builder fully demolished the building. Um, then they built a modern multi-flat complex in the place in its space. The family maintains the first two floors here. Um, right now it's limited to four, but if that's ever extended and they're able to build more, the builders will have access to, to the additional floors through time. Um, so this is a really common kind of trajectory through time of the 100 squared plot homes. Let me touch on a few of the other types I, I introduced earlier. 200 square yard plot homes obviously left more space for variation. Um, these are what were originally three identical homes in Nizamuddin. They were allotted to three different brothers. And you can see that each family has altered the house in very different ways through time, adding on different various degrees of space. Um, four unit housing made it a little bit harder to alter buildings through time, but it was still small enough that you could buy out your neighbor above you or buy out your neighbor below you and kind of cohesively redesign at least one half of the building. So on the left, you see um, a very rare example of one that is abandoned that wasn't changed. That's the original form. In the middle, one half has been modernized. And in the final version, you may not recognize it if you passed on the street, but this is a four unit where both sides have been turned into two different, um, two different homes. Um, double story complexes, because they were shared among so many individuals, were really difficult to alter through time. However, families have still made use of them as small private residences, commercial space, um, paying guest rentals are a very common use of these types of spaces. And they still are valuable because they're located in really prized portions of the city. Um, often they're used creatively too. Here's one example of multiple units that have been conjoined to become a Hindu mandir, which is kind of interesting. That's a very unique rare example. There aren't too many of those. Um, through these various types of changes, refugee colonies have become some of the most valuable real estate in Delhi, quite actually. So this is a heat map that shows high rent areas in the city. I made it using um, public available information from housing.com from 2022. The more yellow an area, the higher the rent. Now let's think about where the refugee colonies that I personally surveyed are located. And you can kind of just tell visually that they really cluster in high rent areas. And the statistics backs that up. Um, refugee colonies are much more likely to be high value areas than is just a random residential neighborhood in Delhi. And they're also very centrally conveniently located within the city. Um, unsurprisingly, this high value means that non-refugees often aspire to own properties in such areas. In fact, um, one of my favorite stories that I collected during my research was this family who had been internally displaced within Delhi. Um, they had lived in a Muslim majority village near Meharali, um, which was really attacked during the partition. So their, their home was destroyed, but they were not considered refugees, even though it was actually a Hindu family. Um, and they were 
fairly bitter. They were humble, but bitter about the fact that they weren't considered refugees and they didn't have access to this type of space. So through time, they tried to buy into one of these areas and they acquired the financial ability to do so only in 2015. And they bought a unit within a double story complex, which again is the lowest tier of the refugee kind of housing. And they were extremely prideful in showing us around um, this unit that they spent so many years trying to acquire. Um, in addition to remaining sought after economic assets, colony housing units also have contributed to refugees' sense of legitimacy in the city in more lived and qualitative ways. When discussing their lives and sense of belonging in colonies, residents commonly spoke with affection for their homes and communities, as some of these quotes on this slide demonstrate. This pattern that I am talking about of people actually feeling at home and liking this type of government provided housing is fairly surprising, especially when you consider other largely qualitative archeological analyses of social welfare housing. When central authorities orchestrate such massive building initiatives directed towards social reform, the results are often not so productive. For example, archaeologist Victor Buchli considered a Soviet communal apartment complex in Moscow in his book, The Archaeology of Socialism. Um, archaeologist Rodney Harrison considered council houses here in the UK, establishing what he termed an archaeology of the welfare state. Both scholars presented the forms of public housing they studied as majorly problematic. While the design of the Soviet apartment was too heavy handedly tied to trying to force equality and communalism, the council houses Harrison studied had transitioned from, as he put it, quote, from utopia to dystopia. And um, I think that this assumption is kind of mirrored here. Samina, I hope you don't mind me saying this. Um, but when Samina was talking about looking for housing yesterday, she derogatively described one unit she looked at as um, two council housey. <laughs> so it is kind of a correct assumption, it seems. In both Butchley and Harrison's work, um, the short sightedness of planners was something to be overcome by the creative navigations of individuals who found ways of making do under restrictive circumstances and limited autonomy. In contrast, the refugee housing units in Delhi, aside from the atypical examples that I discussed, um, were characterized by discrete autonomously owned units, scalable design, and a flexibility of use. Because of these material attributes, Delhi's refugees could more easily make use of allotted housing than could residents in these other examples. They could alter the homes, finding different uses for them as their needs changed, and especially as their families grew through time. Displacement studies scholars in various disciplines repeatedly highlight the superiority of such flexible forms of aid aid that allows for the aid receiver to maintain autonomy and act creatively. This is more effective because there's no way for central aid distributor to be able to comprehend all of the unique particularities of needs on the ground. And when aid is not flexible, when there's kind of a one size fit all solution that's prescribed, aid receivers often find workarounds. So as probably the most famous example, when modern day refugees are given food aid, they commonly resell packets of provided food for much less than the market rate to obtain cash, which is a much more flexible resource. As one team of economics, economists focused on the evaluation of the UN World Food Program within refugee camps, has summarized this shift from in-kind aid to cash appears to increase refugee welfare in fundamental ways, enabling refugees to interact efficiently with the economy around them and increasing refugee welfare while creating benefits for host community businesses and households. The long lasting usefulness of Delhi's partition refugee housing is illustrative of how this conclusion may apply in the case of housing and shelter related aid provisioning as well. You might be wondering at this point in my talk, what about public perceptions? 
is the government colony an important component of partition associated public memory? Not so much, at least I would argue not so much. Um, by public memory here, I'm referring to dominant narratives amongst refugees, descendant communities, and Delhi residents more broadly. In this context, the effective role of state welfare, oh, you can't see my quote here, can you? There you go. <clears throat> is not usually the focus of partition stories. Instead, refugee success is primarily attributed to things like Punjabi industriousness and exceptionalism. The transformation of housing colonies serve as the ultimate material proof of this reading of the past being accurate. Refugees often describe the mid-century Delhi they encounter after migration as a complete jungle, as empty land, often filled with jackals. You hear about the jackals all the time. And in this, they stress how they were uncomplaining and resilient as they faced life under these types of conditions. In contrast, today their neighborhoods are full of towering modern homes that they themselves have constructed. For refugee communities, this contrast between the rudimentary allotment homes they were given and the homes and businesses they've established is a material testament to their self-sufficiency and their right to belong. This story is absolutely valid, um, but it's also incomplete because the rudimentary na nature of the original allotted homes was largely by design, and it also contributed to their lasting usefulness um, through time. This reading of the past this focus on refugee exceptionalism is echoed not only amongst members of the refugee and refugee descendant community in Delhi, but also amongst the public more broadly. These are some examples of recent headlines that describe Delhi as a city of rent refugee enterprise. 1947 gave birth to a new identity, a new ambition, a new Delhi. The breakneck speed at which Delhi is growing was triggered by the arrival of refugees, et cetera. It's unfortunate that the impact of state welfare systems is not often credited in these narratives. And I really see this as an opportunity missed. Focus on individual accomplishment is also prominent in academic accounts of the partition. Especially in the last 30 years, the proliferation of scholarship has centered on partition experiences. Um, much of this work has incorporated oral historical accounts and it's centered on documenting trauma and hardship. In particular, many scholars have focused on the particularities of hardships faced by different subsections of refugee communities. For example, women, the poor, religious minorities who chose to remain in different situations. Recording these accounts of unthinkable human suffering is very important work. However, here too, the result is a foregrounding of self-made success people were the victims of a political system and their salvation was ultimately their own resilience. And in my opinion, this may not attribute enough importance to the contributions of government policy and aid systems. There's um, a concept in historical archeology span known as gotcha archeology. span This is when what you're seeing materially is seen as completely challenging what is within written documents. And I am certainly not attempting to do that here. This is not gotcha archeology. span I don't wish to undermine the accomplishments of refugees, which were undoubtedly immense. However, the central role of the government in shaping people's post-partition realities must be recognized. The massive scale investments in permanent resettlement infrastructures that I documented in the field contributed to refugees' ability to belong and succeed in this way. And I see this more broadly beyond Delhi, beyond India, as demonstrating that when governments want to, they can support even unthinkably massive populations of displaced, dispossessed people. Separation from a home and a personal past is not inherently debilitating. Instead, we find here at the heart of displacement's crisis, power structures, the state's definitions of who is worthy and who is not, and the state's control of resources and access. And the state's role here can be either positive or negative. It's not inherently negative. It can greatly contribute to people's well-being or increase their hardships. 
Following from this understanding, I feel it's important to acknowledge the ways in which partition refugee success is at least in part the result of the fact that the state viewed them as both legitimate and as potential agents of modernization worth investing in. And this fact draws into question the perpetual struggle of so many modern day asylum seekers in urban centers around the world. Why do most not have access to the resources partition refugees did? Couldn't they be just as successful as they did? Couldn't they too quickly rebuild and regain a sense of belonging if given even very basic minimal types of supports? I'd like to evoke here um, the sociologist Nandita Sharma's recent discussion of the inherent violence and post-colonial resilience of nation state ideals, which sort people into binary categories of origin associated belonging. Partition refugees had what she terms autochthons status. They were persons of a place. And as such, they escaped the stigmas associated with being autochthons, outsiders, invaders who inherently disrupt original orders. Partition refugees were disadvantaged in many ways. They lost their homes and livelihoods and they survived unthinkable trauma. But as autochthons, they were viewed by the state as deserving of support. And this perceived deservedness was tied up in understandings of an imagined past, cultural origins and rightful spatialities. Speaking more broadly about the discipline of archaeology's contributions to discussions of national belonging, many archaeologists have developed impactful critiques of nationalist readings of the past. Um, these are a couple that I view as really salient and important, but there are many, many more. Um, but I question whether this is enough. Archaeologists must make sure that our primary focus on the past is not also privileging the past. Historic cultural symbols, no matter how hybridized and fluid they might be, depict identity and belonging as something inherited. Changeable maybe, but inherited nonetheless. I'm not suggesting that we should avoid discussion of how historic contexts continue to shape people's positions and perspectives today, but I am suggesting that we also need to draw attention to emergent heritage, to the fact that the human energies being poured into locations in the present should be just as legitimizing and just as worthy of study and reverence as the human energies that were poured in by our predecessors in the past. To this end, I view post-partition Delhi not as an ideal example of how national communities might be more inclusive because as I've suggested, partition refugees acceptance is in part owed to their autochthon status. Nonetheless, post-partition Delhi is an ideal example of how national belonging is highly mutable. Understandings of national belonging can grow to accommodate even those without personal material paths within a national territory. We cannot blame exclusion on the past. Belonging is not a predetermined precedent. We repeatedly choose it. And um, with that, I'd like to welcome questions from Samita and the audience. Thank <laughs> you.